Hi guys, thanks for listening to this bonus episode of Once Upon a Crime. This bonus episode is going to detail an event that I was fortunate enough to go to this past weekend. Dean Strang and Jerry Buting from Making a Murderer fame, they're the defense lawyers for Stephen Avery, were in San Francisco, which is just uh, a little ways away from where I live here in the South Bay, San Jose. And um, they were doing a talk called A Conversation on Justice. So I recorded a couple little clips. I will play those for you. And then I will kind of... Uh, go and look at the notes that I wrote while I was there and talk a little bit about what it is they shared. It was a pretty interesting conversation, so I hope you enjoy it. Be back in a minute. I'm here across the street from the Orfield in beautiful downtown San Francisco. You can probably hear the the sounds of the city. And going to get in line to, for the VIP experience with making a murderer, Dean Strang and Gary Buting, and hopefully I get there in time to get a picture. I'll report back in a bit. So you might have noticed there on my clip as I was in, in the street, on the streets of San Francisco, as it were, um, that I had a little slip of the tongue. I think I said Gary Buting instead of Jerry Buting, but that's kind of what happens when you are walking and talking and trying to record um, and at the same time trying to dodge San Francisco traffic. So (laughs) there was a little bit of a slip up there, but I think you know what I was talking about. So one more clip here for you. It's uh, on my way back. So it ended a little bit, um, I think it was around 1030 at night and I still had to drive about an hour home. So on the way I had to stop and get some food because I was starving and um you kind of hear me in my car idling. I was actually in and out burger right off the the freeway because it was one thing that was open around 11 o'clock. So, um, and uh, if you know, I'm not sure in and outs all over the country, but it started here in Southern California and became a huge deal. Um, And so there's long lines at every drive through, no matter what time you go. So I had a little time to talk to you uh, while I was waiting in line. So here you go. Just heading back from San Francisco from the Jerry Buting and Dean Strang uh, conversation at the Warfield. Um, it was a really great time. So we there was about, I would say about 25 of us that were there who got to have a meet and greet before. So they came out. It was basically we were in this, the big, beautiful Warfield Theater. Uh, it was completely empty except for, like I said, about 20, 25 of us. Strang and Buting came out and just chatted, just asked us if we had any questions and just said hello and uh, very, very nice, very funny. Um, I got to ask a question that uh, Dean Strang thought was a very interesting question, so I was really excited about that and they went into detail about that a little bit. Um, And then afterwards we went outside to kind of like the reception area in the war field and got to take a really um, cool picture with them. And I've already posted that on Twitter, so you might have seen that. Okay, so that was that clip. But unfortunately, (laughs) I ran out of uh, memory on my uh, recorder uh, SD card. So I didn't get to say, finish saying what I was going to say. So basically, I I was just going to let you know that what I'm doing now is I'm going to share with you um, the impressions that I got at the talk. But let me first tell you a little bit about um, what this was about so Dean Strang and Jerry Buting were, like I said, the defense lawyers for, um, on, they were on the documentary Making a Murderer, and they were Stephen Avery's defense lawyers during his murder trial. So as you know, that documentary series um, just became huge. It just blew up, and there's been all kinds of things written about it and podcasted about it and everything else um, on TV shows, and, you know, it just became huge. So they are now on a speaking tour, um, and one of their stops was here in San Francisco. So several months ago, I purchased tickets. I thought it would be pretty interesting to hear what they had to say. I also heard they were going to have a little bit of a QA, and a which I thought would be, you know, kind of cool. So um, when I got these tickets several months ago, I did not even realize until last week when I got an email from the place where I purchased the tickets saying, 
here's your special instructions for the day of the, the event. And basically what it said is um, the doors open at 7 p.m., the conversation starts at 8 p.m., um, but you, having a VIP ticket, can come at 5 p.m., and we will open the doors um, earlier, and you will have a one-on-one -on -one time Q&A with Mr. Strang and Mr. Buting, plus a photo opportunity. And I was like, really? I didn't even know that I purchased that, but that's awesome. So so I headed up there and uh, was trying to get there. So if you've ever been in the San Francisco area, you know, once you get downtown, and this was at the Warfield, which is right on Market Street, which is right in the heart of downtown in San Francisco, which, you know, gets pretty crazy, especially on the weekends. But so running to get up there and get there on time and not wanting to miss all of that. So you can kind of hear me a little bit out of breath trying to trying to get to the venue. So anyway, it was really cool. It was awesome because we got there and there was probably, I think, I think there was maybe, maybe 25 people max um, that were there. And as a matter of fact, they delayed it a, a few minutes because they said there were people that were supposed to be coming, the VIP ticket holders who, and there was a whole bunch more of what's supposed to be there that were not there. I really kind of think what happened is what happened with me is I didn't realize I was purchasing a VIP ticket. I bought it so long ago that um, perhaps that happened the same thing. I just was lucky enough to um, get that email that I noticed um, the week before and get there early. But I'm thinking maybe there's some people that just didn't even know. And so maybe that's why. But anyway, that's the reason why we started a little bit later. They basically said, OK, sit right here. They So anyway, they let us into the Warfield Theater and... Um, which is a beautiful, a beautiful theater. And it was completely empty. Um, so we sat in these kind of front row-ish kind of seats. And they said, wait right here, and we will be bringing them out shortly. Oh, and they basically said, ask whatever you want to ask. If you want to write it down on a card, and, you know, they'll answer it later, but you have plenty of time to ask them questions right now. So sure enough, in the dark of the theater, about, you know, 10 minutes later, uh, it was Dean Strang and Jerry Buting, which was very odd to see them in person after seeing them for so long, you know, on film, um, you know, came walking out in their very lawyerly look in their suits and ties and, uh, and they're, you know, wearing glasses just like in, in the, the movie. So, you know, it wasn't like they came out in, you know, summer wear or beach wear or anything like that. They very much look like you would expect them to look. Um came out, just kind of walked up very, you know, casually and said, hey, how's everybody doing? You know, um, it's great to be here. And, you know, thanks for having us. And, uh, you know, go ahead and ask any question you want to ask. So, you know, we just kind of all moved in really, you know, sat right, you know, right where they were standing and asked a bunch of questions. And I guess maybe I should go over a little bit. I don't, I'm not going to go over it much because I think most people who are listening to this basically know all about making a murder, probably have seen it, if not... Uh, you know, form their own opinions about what that was all about. So, of course, Making a Murderer was a documentary that was made. It was actually following the case of Stephen Avery, who had been um, falsely accused and convicted of a rape and had spent 17 years in prison for that rape when he was exonerated by DNA evidence and was released. So he then filed a lawsuit against Manitowoc County, which is a county that had accused him of this crime and had convicted him. And he was asking for damages, I believe, in the tens of millions. And that was about ready to go to um, go before the court it was, I think, just beginning when a young woman who had had a appointment set up at the Avery property um, went missing. She ultimately was found uh, murdered. She actually they found some um, some of her remains on the Avery property, along with her car. And he was accused. He was a suspect, and he was accused of her murder. So the reason why this is so such an interesting case, and I believe the reason why the documentary was so um, popular, was this is the very first time um, Strang and Beauty basically you know, made this comment several times that. This was the only time, the only time in American history that an exoneree had been um, accused of such a, an, an, you know, another, a, a, actually a homicide after being exonerated from the original charges. So it was, you know, very interesting. So this documentary followed um, 
the Avery case, I believe, over like 10 years. And this is where this documentary came out. So we do see Mr. Strang and Mr. Buting um, defending Stephen Avery through the, you know, this whole murder trial. So there were some things, some, so some of the, the really interesting points that came out, um, everybody knows a lot about the case that have watched the documentary or followed this. And so there are some, some questions that came out that maybe either had been forgotten or just weren't covered because, of course, the documentary was, even though it was 10 hours long, it could not cover all of these, you know, many, 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 many hours of filming that were done. So some things, of course, had to be edited out and people being, you know, sharp um, watchers of true crime documentaries had some questions. From our little group, some of the things that came out was somebody had asked about how did they find something, you know, odd or or, um, unexplained about how easily Teresa Hallback's car was found on this, you know, huge property where there was um, a million cars. So basically they, they ran as auto salvage yard that had, you know, like miles worth of cars, you know, abandoned, no, not abandoned, but, um, you know, cars there that were either being ready to be used for parts or to be crushed or whatever they were doing with them. But they were, so Teresa Hallback's car was found within, you know, an hour of searching for her car on the property. And one thing that I wrote down that I thought was pretty interesting is that, um, I believe it was, um, Dean Strang, who said that one of the things they found very odd was that the person, if they had taken this car from where Teresa would have been, you know, probably been if she had been at the Avery, you know, house um, and to where the car was found, they would have had to pass by the car crusher to take the car to this area where it was found. So if you have to pass the car crusher, wouldn't it kind of, you're trying to conceal a car if you, you know, this is the the theory that she had been murdered and they were trying to conceal this car, uh, why wouldn't you just crush this car? I mean, that would be pretty well concealed. Um, so that was an interesting point. Um, they also asked about other suspects, if they had um, identified any other suspects. They said, well, they have their own ideas, but they can't necessarily <laughs> say, yeah, so-and-so did it. This isn't Perry Mason, he said, but, you know, too bad that it it isn't, but so we can't really speak uh, about that specifically, he said, but they did identify eight possible suspects that were not Stephen Avery. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Asked about the jurors, did they get to talk to the jurors after the fact? And they said that they didn't interview the jurors. Um, they would have liked to, but it, it's like the jurors really didn't want to talk um, after, after the fact. So they basically took a pass and said, you know, we don't really want to be questioned by the attorneys. Because a lot of times I guess the attorneys do that. They'll say, okay, what was it? He goes, and we we ask specific questions like, what of the evidence did you, was there anything you didn't understand? Was there anything that you thought was good evidence? Um, Was there something we did that you didn't like? You know, trying to get information and feedback about their case. Um, but they didn't want to do that. The only one, there was actually two. One was the excused juror. There was an excused juror, a man, who actually contacted them um, before, so after the verdict, but before Stephen Avery's sentencing, contacted them um, and wanted to talk to them and give him his impressions of, you know, what he thought. Um, This man also went to Brendan Dassey's trial. He was there every day during Brendan Dassey's trial. And there was another woman on the jury because Brenda Dassey and um, Avery were both um, accused of this murder, but they had separate trials, if you remember that. Brenda Dassey's trial came after Stephen Avery's, and this excused her, and actually another woman who was on the jury went to Brenda Dassey's um, trial as well. There was an interesting, when they they went back and they asked again about the other suspects, because they didn't want to let that lie. They were like, okay, give, give give us something with that, right? So there is somebody, apparently, you can go on Reddit and read a lot about this, they said. Um, but there was, so Teresa Hallback was making these appointments because so she would go and take photographs of, you know, people who were selling their cars for this auto trader magazine. Um, and so Stephen Avery's was one of the clients that day. There was another client, I believe the, the, it's pronounced George Zip, Zipperer, Zipperer. I'm not sure how that's spelled, but George Zipperer. So that was another appointment that she had. Well, 
this man was interviewed because he was on her list of people that she was supposed to see that day. Um, and it was really odd. And like I said, they said you can get a lot of information and, and details about this on Reddit if you if you care to go down that rabbit hole. But um, that this man was, was very, very interesting because he was very belligerent. When they interviewed him, he was kind of all over the place. He was kind of would say that this happened and that happened and then he didn't want to talk and then but just very odd, like wouldn't straightforwardly ask, answer questions about, you know, what happened that day? Did he see Teresa Halbach? What was, you know, that kind of thing. So he's a very interesting uh, suspect. They said I, that they would have definitely, if they had been, you know, the detectives would have definitely wanted to, you know, delve into that a little bit more, find out what was going on there. So the question that I asked, and I'm going to throw a shout out to one of my true crime book um, Members, I have a true crime uh, uh, book group here in uh, in uh, Campbell, California, and um, so we we meet every once in a you know every about four to six weeks, and we talk about a case or a book. And uh, one, we did talk about this, the making of murder, when it was you know pretty hot on everybody's list of things that they were watching. And uh, one of the our our book group, uh, one of the members, her name is Susan. Her husband came, and, and I'm sorry, but I. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name. I'm sure that it will come to me in a minute, but <laughs> but if it doesn't, uh, Susan's husband, he brought up, and we talked about this quite a bit, about the body being burned in this pit. They found traces, supposedly pieces of bone that they try, you know, were able to do some testing and find out that this was, um, unfortunately, Teresa Halbach's um, body uh, parts or basically bones that were found in this pit. And his question is, well, wait a minute, how, what about, how did that burn to that extent? And how did that, because their theory basically was that they they had had a bonfire that night, um, basically had thrown her things, including her body into this pit and burned her. And I had that question too, because usually when you, you hear these stories about somebody trying to get rid of evidence by burning it, um, get rid of a body by burning it, you always find the body, right? You always find the body pretty much intact, maybe not recognizable, but pretty much intact. And this, they were saying, is basically, you know, small pieces of bone, like like if it had been, you know, a cremated body, right? And Susan's husband had this question and said, well, how is that possible? And he said, I think that it would have to have been a closed, um, you know, a closed, you know, container, like, you know, like they do when they cremate to, to keep that kind of heat, to do that kind of damage. And I, I agreed with him. I thought, you know, that's an interesting point. So I asked that um, to, you know, to, to, and Dean Strang um, answered it when I asked that question. So did you, and basically the question I asked is, did you have an experts or did you do any kind of testing to find out if a body could be burnt to that extent, the way that the state claimed? And he's, he, he, he lit right up when I asked that question and he said, we, de we definitely did. He said, we actually had a forensic um, anthropologist. His um, date name was Dr. F Dr. Scott Fair Fairgrieve, I believe. Um, he said he is in the film, but very, very briefly because they, a lot of that was cut out, but he def they definitely did ask him. And he said this, he said that, there's no way that it could, that the body could be burnt to that. Basically what they're, they're talking about, you know, heat levels and calcification of the bones and all, all of this, you know, scientific kind of stuff that, but bottom line was it would have had to be in a closed container with a consistent heat source for, you know, quite a, quite an amount of time for it to be to that extent, which if it was in an open burn pit, um, and it's like, oh, you know, hey, we're throwing, you know, gas on it. We're throwing a couple of logs here. We're throwing this or that there, you know, every once in a while to keep it burning. He said it, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't, that would not be what would happen to the remains. It would not look that way. It would not happen that way. So I um, give a shout out to Susan's husband. He definitely had his finger <laughs> on the point and gave me a good question to ask. And uh, so that was, that was really, that was really cool. Um, so anyway, then, then what happened is, you know, we got to talk to them for a few minutes and then we were able to go and take a photo, you know, one by one. It's this beautiful place of Warfield and they, they actually set it up where it was a really nicely framed, you know, photo against this beautiful backdrop and, you know, that kind of thing. So if you want to see my, my photo op with, uh, Dean Strang and Jerry Buting, it's on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at, uh, upon a crime. 
So, and there's a, a couple of other pictures up there too. I put the the marquee um, from the war field and uh, I think another one of the photos is when they're speaking to our our small group. But then we came back in when, you know, the general public was able to come back in and talk more about, um, you know, they basically had this conversation. So the person that was the moderator, I wanted just to, to mention him, his name was Henry Lee. And he has been a crime reporter here in the um, San Francisco Bay Area for many, many years. And he works as a reporter here at our local uh, TV channel, KTVU Fox 2. Um, he had also covered crime for the San Francisco Chronicle. So he's been involved in reporting on lots of high profile crimes here in the area. So he was the moderator and asked some very interesting questions. He asked some of his own questions and some of the questions came from the audience who had written down cards before, you know, they came in. Um, so some of the things they're talking about is on this conversation, they called a conversation on justice was, you know, um, of course, one of the first things came up was this idea about mistrust of police. Um, and of course, making a murderer, we, that is very highly, you know, prominent in that case because they're basically saying there's some definite police misconduct here. At least that's the theory of the defense's case, um, you know, as far as just evidence that was found and who found it because there was this lawsuit against Manitowoc County that they were supposed to not be involved in investigation. Very strangely, what happened is that most of the evidence, um, pretty much all of the evidence, the, 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 the key to the car, uh, the bullet in the garage, um, you know, whatever else things were found, were, were found by Manitowoc County investigators after many days of searching. So that was, um, so that's a big kind of thing that has come out. And that's why they were talking about mistrust of police. Um, and they're saying, you know, it, it, what's interesting about this is when we talk about mistrust of police, of course, the things that we see in the news tend to be urban areas, possibly, um, minorities against the, you know, minority suspects against white, you know, white police against more minority suspects, that kind of thing. And he said, and this is what's very different about this case is because, you know, uh, Manitowoc County in Wisconsin is very rural and very white. And yet it's not about so much about, you know, race, it's about class. So even though, I mean, the Avery's, I mean, to to make you know to make it very clear they're just not these you know highfalutin <laughs> so society types you know they're kind of salt of the earth kind of you know they have this big property a lot of them live in these trailers not well educated there's a, he said in this county you know not much above high school level if that a lot of just working people a lot of elderly people um that are there not, you know, that kind of thing. And they, and they went into that more when they were talking about the jury, jury selection of, you know, who they were able to choose from in the jury. And basically that is the jury pool in this area. It's older, white, um, you know, working class, uh, not college, you know, educated people. Next thing they talked about a little bit was just the fame, the fame that they've received from this, you know, here's these two guys, um, defense attorneys, you know, just kind of doing their jobs and when making a murder comes out and they just happen to be, you know, filmed because they're making a documentary and then this thing comes out and it totally blows up and it's just amazing how, you know, they're recognized, you know, everywhere they go and it's just really odd because, you know, they never set out to be celebrities or, you know, they, they uh, we're being teased because they're being called these, these heartthrobs, you know, and that kind of thing. If you want to know, uh, Jerry Buting is on Twitter. Dean Strang is not. Uh, Jerry Buting is at Jay Buting at, um, at Jay Buting, B-U-T-I-N-G. So he's got quite, quite a lot of followers. Um, and then he said, you know, one thing you need to understand is that 80% of the population of the United States cannot afford a lawyer. You know, so really public defenders are it for many, many, many people. So a couple other points here that were interesting um, that I found interesting that I took some notes on at uh, the conversation was that, as we said be uh, before, how uh, Dean Strang and Jerry Buting have become these, you know, quasi heartthrobs <laughs> out in the world now. Um, but they were saying, you know, when you are a criminal defense attorney, you are not a popular person. Um, that is usually not how it works out. 
he said, you know, you're especially in this case, and because it was really tried in the media, and they really said you, you had to be there to realize how much the public turned on Stephen Avery after this um, charge was leveled against him for the homicide of Teresa Halbach. He said he, he was the most hated man in Wisconsin since Jeffrey Dahmer. And he goes, and that's pretty bad. So um, that was, you know, that's what they were working with. He goes, that this is what we are walking into every day. And of course, you know, you don't get that now because, you know, we basically have been put out as these, you know, heroes for justice, which is is awesome and wonderful, but that is not how it normally looks or feels when you are a criminal defense attorney, which I thought was interesting. And going into jury selection, they were talking a little bit about that. And we were talking about how who the jury was made up of, you know, who, you know, people from the community, which, you know, I kind of outlined that before. Um, and they said the prosecutors, this was interesting to me, and I, I might have gotten this a little bit wrong, but I think I heard it right, and I did write this down, um, that when they go into where they're able to challenge and decide, you know, who's going to sit on the jury, that the, prosecute, the prosecutor's side um, has unlimited challenges, basically can decide no, 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 yes, 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 however many times they want to do that, where the defense side gets six, and I believe I heard that right, um, six challenges only. And they said one of the things, the one question that the prosecutor asked every person who was a potential juror was, are you a person who likes puzzles or do you prefer to have the big picture? So basically if they said they liked puzzles, you know, getting something, putting it together, figuring it out all out. They would say, thank you for coming. You're, you're dismissed. <laughs> so, and he said, you know, and if you think about that, of course we want people who like puzzles and like to think things through and see how this fits and not just being handed this picture and saying, oh, look at this picture. This is what it is. Um, he said, so that was, you know, we can, that was a, another challenge for us. They talked a little bit about the state of the prisons here in the United States in our modern times. Um, they're talking about prison is no longer being rehabilitative for the most part. It's very, it's just punitive. That We give out the longest sentence of pretty much any country. Um, our sentences are longer than anybody's. Um, of course, we know that we have uh, the highest rate of prisoners per capita in the United States than any other country. And that includes, you know, China, Russia, North Korea, which is pretty amazing. And then he did bring up, while there are, you know, these exonerees, and we have found, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people who are falsely accused and convicted and, and put into prison. He said, you know, there are those out there. He said, but what you need to really realize is there are tens of thousands of Brendan Dassey's in prisons around the country. And what he means by that is, this is the most common uh, makeup of our prisoners in, in, in prisons in the United States is these are men between the ages of 15 to 26 or 27. They tend to be financially impoverished. They tend to be lower on the intelligence scale. Many are people with learning disabilities, lower level, being able to, you know, think things through and respond. They tend to not have a, a good support system, either financially, emotionally, uh, family-wise. They just are kind of thrown to the wolves. And this is, this is a, an epidemic, he says, in our prisons today. This is a quote that I put that I thought was especially poignant. He said, there's human wreckage all around us in the criminal justice system. And he says, it's on, it's on both sides. It's on of course, obviously the victims, you know, victims and their, their family and their loved ones are just left. And he, he gave um, a lot of credit to Teresa Hallback's family. He goes, just wonderful, classy people, you know, just basically held their head high. They were, they showed dignity through the whole procedure, even though they were in, you know, an enormous amount of pain over losing their, you know, their loved one. And uh, he goes, but, you know, that family is, is going to have that pain their entire lives. That's not something that goes away. He said, but then you look at the other side and he goes, and that was the thing about making a murderer that was, um, I think was really interesting for people to see is that they also saw Brendan Dassey's family, Stephen Avery's family, like his parents and saw what was left behind when, you know, this happens to a family. It's, 
even if let's say, you know, this person is guilty and did this thing, but, but their families are still left behind and they are, they are also make up part of the wreckage. So, um, which we need to remember, it, it doesn't just stop at the victim. It doesn't just stop at a husband or a wife or a mother or a father, but it really has a ripple effect throughout their family and the community. And they basically just said, you know, we're hoping by going out and speaking that this is just the beginning of a conversation on justice. It's not the end. You know, and we want to take these, you know, and there's many other points that they made. And if you get a chance to see them on the speaking tour and you're all interested in this, you know, definitely go, go see it because I'm sure it's a little different every time. But they said, you know, we want this to be a beginning of a conversation. We're hoping that this... Um, you know, in some way, you know, affects your thinking um, and maybe you're wanting to take it to another level to work for, you know, legislation that helps, you know, victims or helps people that are falsely accused or whatever it is that may um, strike a chord with you. And he said, and as individuals, what we can do right now is to become active and become aware of what's happening in the justice system. And I think this, you know, things like, you know, podcasts and these documentaries and, and shows that, you know, show these cases and a lot of these, um, you know, podcasts that are, they're going out and they're doing some investigations of their own and these things. I think it's really putting this in the public eye. It's not behind a curtain anymore. It's, it's out there for us all to see and to respond to. So if this is something that you feel, you know, strongly about or somehow, you know, strikes a nerve with you, by all means, you know, get involved. So that's it. Um, I just wanted to share what I could there with you as far as in the impressions I took away. And there was, of course, more, but don't want this to go on, you know, forever. This is a, just wanted to make this a short bonus episode to be able to share with you guys. Just a couple of things I wanted to make you aware of is um, I mentioned on my last, uh, the last episode that I'll be heading to Fort Lauderdale, Florida here in a couple of days. Really excited about that. I'm going to the uh, meetup, the Sword and Scale meetup that's uh, put on by uh, Mike Boudet, the podcast host of Sword and Scale, and also Justin Evans from the Generation Y podcast is going to be there. So it's going to be awesome. I can't wait. Um, I will be recording some things while I'm there and putting that together for you guys when I return next week. And other than that, um, I will am working also on the next episode in our series, Kids Who Kill. And that will be coming out in the second week of July. So look, be looking forward to that. I know I am. So just wanted to share that with you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you have a great week and a great weekend. And I'll be talking to you soon. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.